Okay, yeah, so um, I guess I've had the introduction, but yeah, just very briefly, I, I moved here uh, summer last year to join OpenAI, and before I used to work at DeepMind for eight years, and I've been working on large language models uh, for, yeah, a fair, a fair few years. Uh, and actually, what I'm gonna do today is talk about um, some of the downstream training that has really transformed the capabilities and the usability and the usefulness of language models and some of this research that's come out in the last couple of years. And I'm actually gonna kind of give a survey of a fair few different uh, labs um, kind of offerings. So this is not really me kind of plugging my own work. This is actually just trying to give a bit of a overview of the space from a research perspective. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of talk in three parts and the first one is kind of a background, maybe to get everyone on the same page. And the message of the first one is uh, although maybe you feel like you know language models, it's true. Their primary purpose, the thing that they're trained to do, their joie de vivre for a language model itself is just to emit probabilities. So what do I mean by that? So stripping back from talking about GPT-3 or ChatGPT, etc., going back to kind of what's the mathematical definition of a language model, it's something which is trying to model the density, the probability density of text. So it's trying to estimate a incredibly kind of difficult to imagine probability density function over maybe all of the text that we have availability to. So that's what they're trained to do. The current best approach to actually uh, attacking this almost kind of intractable problem, this problem that seems almost impossible to kind of start with, is to break down the probability of text into these joint probabilities uh, using the chain rule from probability. Uh, so break it down into a next word prediction task, which can actually help you reconstruct the probability density function and specifically uh, estimate this next word probability uh, using a large neural network where the current state of the art is a transformer. So your GBT, GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, you can imagine what keeps on going. This is, uh, these are essentially an instance, a state of the art instance of a very simple idea, which is model the probability of text. So, okay. Why would you want to model the probability of text? What is it even useful for? Um, well, one thing it can be useful for is classification. So maybe if you have a bunch of different uh, responses given a prompt, you might want to classify them. You might want to choose uh, which is the most likely. So you can kind of just calculate these conditional probabilities and take the max, boom, you have classification. Maybe you want to actually generate text. That's the thing I think most people consider language models as their primary purpose. Um, yeah, you can do that too. You take these probabilities, you roll the dice, and uh, you know, if you have a probability of a next word, you can roll the dice and actually choose one of those next words given that probability, repeat that process, and then boom, you're, you're, you're sampling text. But one point of this background is to kind of highlight that actually sampling itself is an additional process on top of the language model's actual training uh, regime. The language model is just trained to have a good job at estimating probabilities of text, but then we kind of put an extra process on top, which is sampling, which the model isn't actually explicitly trained to do. Um, over the last, I guess you could say, seven decades, um, language models are getting better and better at modeling text. We measure this with cross entropy. Cross entropy goes down, they're doing a better job at modeling the empirical distribution of text. That's great, but pretty dry. Who really kind of wakes up in the morning and cares about cross entropy? Well, I guess one reason is because when we invert this back to this sampling procedure, as cross entropy is going down over the decades, sample quality has been going up, and the usefulness and the kind of fluency of language models has been kind of becoming more and more astounding. So even if we go back to the 50s, uh, Claude Shannon, he's literally fitting uh, a language model based on uh, text statistics, which are actually published in a book, and he is manually sampling from that. He published in his uh, theory of mathematical theory of communication a little sample from his uh, two gram language model, and he was absolutely blown away by it. So this representing and speedily is and good apt or can blah blah blah. He thought that was incredible at the time. He was like, "Ooh, I feel like from from noise we're starting to see something which is looking a bit more like human text, and that's pretty cool." And he kind of conjectured if you could make these systems powerful enough then they could start to look indistinguishable from human texts. They could start to be incredibly useful. So I'd say, yeah, another two examples along the road of that. Uh, four years ago to yesterday, the GPT-2 um, paper came out. This was a paper from OpenAI from Alec Radford and his colleagues, where at the time, this was a larger language model than people had trained, and in their blog post, they had a fun sample about uh, some kind of fictional unicorn story, and it kind of blew people's mind with, that were working in that space. They thought, wow, I didn't realize 
neural networks could kind of create such a long and uh, coherent story that was completely fabricated, that wasn't just based on something that existed before. And then if we go to basically the present day, a few months ago, I think people are in their masses starting to understand kind of the interestingness of sampling from these models via ChatGPT. It's got millions of users. I just decided to make this as the example as of this morning, but pretty much you can find your own favorite example with ChatGPT. It can do lots of fun stuff, but poetry is particularly great. So, you know, writing a poem about capital gains tax in the style of a sailor can do a pretty good job, probably better than I could. So sampling is fun, but okay, there's one problem, which is we can't just make the models more powerful and expect everything to work very well. So actually sampling from language models is incredibly brittle. And if you want them to do useful and reliable things, this is kind of problematic. So if I take the base model that is used behind ChatGBT, this is, it's a, a 3.5 series model from OpenAI. It's probably one of the strongest language models uh, available that you could access via an API. And I just ask it a simple question, what is the capital of Peru? Maybe I might want it to answer the question. But I might be surprised, actually, if I sample from this model, then it might just start, well, this is a real example. Uh, it, it just starts listing other questions. Uh, and it even then starts to repeat itself. So, okay, why is this? Now I want to go back to the background. One reason is, uh, I'll actually start with notable reason number two. One reason is we don't train the model to sample during training time. It's just measuring the probabilities of text, and then we roll the dice on that. And so because it's not trained to necessarily sample coherently, I think we can find lots of artifacts during this sampling process. So we can see things like repetition, which might look a bit strange. But the other one in the, this example really highlights is just that this language model is trying to kind of uh, encapsulate a very broad probability distribution of all types of text. And if you ask it a question, it's very uh, probable that if it's just looking at questions on the internet, it's looking at a web page full of uh, lists of questions. So it's happy to do this. So okay, why is this brittle? It's brittle because what we really don't want is just some kind of like amorphous probability distribution of raw text. We want something which is gonna generate text which is actually useful. So I'm gonna talk about survey of approaches to achieve that. But before I do, I'm gonna go onto a tangential topic. Uh, I'm gonna call it sampling is hard. And the reason I'm gonna have this tangent is because I want to drum home the fact that this isn't just a capability issue with language models. In fact, we often uh, make an assessment of how good a language model is based on uh, sampling from it. However, it really matters how we use the model. Um, and, and if we use the model in different ways, it can actually give us like, very different kind of conclusions. So I'm going to be specifically looking at the difference in some trends with making a model more powerful when you sample from it versus when you classify. And I think, honestly, uh, not many people are aware of these phenomena, so I think um, I wanted to add it in. So one thing that's on people's minds a lot at the moment with sampling from language models, generative AI, is hallucinations. Okay, I'm actually gonna start from the classification side. As we make language models more powerful, one thing that people maybe aren't super aware of is they actually get better at quantifying their own uncertainty. So they become more and more calibrated classifiers, and they also actually become better fact checkers, which might feel a bit weird because we're gonna see later they also become kind of worse hallucinators. So when we take a language model and we put it in the classification scenario, which is much closer to its original training task of just measuring the probability of text, uh, this is a result that we had from DeepMind actually in a, in a Gopher paper. So on the left, um, this is evaluating the model on like multiple choice human exams on a, a series of 57 different ones. And we just look at the calibration of the model. So when the model places like a 30% probability uh, on an answer, we look like, oh, was it right 30% of the time? 50%, 60%, et cetera. And what we find is actually the model's own probabilities without any kind of downstream training or any tricks are actually pretty well calibrated, which is kind of weird because it feels like the story is that as language models get bigger, they kind of lie more and they don't know what the truth is, et cetera. But actually, if you apply them in a classification setting, you can get something which is pretty calibrated. And I would say it's pretty hard to get humans to be this calibrated, to be honest. On the right-hand side, uh, looking at a fact-checking benchmark um, called Fever, um, without really any specialization to that domain, we could take a language model, so this was a language model from DeepMind called Gopher, uh, and we could just apply it straight to the benchmark, and it was actually essentially on par with state-of-the-art approaches, which have a lot of domain specialization, uh, doing fact-checking. So it actually had a pretty good, like empirically it was pretty good at de deciding when things were like true and false, at least within the distribution of what this fact-checking benchmark measured. 
However, as we all know, if you then sample from the model, it can give you very confident, incorrect generations. So I just asked it uh, this morning, who won the Super Bowl in 2023? Obviously, this is after the training set cut off anyway, so you wouldn't know, um, and state how confident you are. And so this is the base model of GPT 3.5, the original language model. So it's the Patriots, 100% confident. OK, not so great. I'll give you another example of classification versus generation giving totally different uh, findings. So harmful text. As, la as language models get bigger, so this is on the, right, on the x-axis, we have like number of parameters. On the y-axis, we have classification accuracy on a, um, a kind of toxic text classification task. As we increase the size of uh, these neural networks, they get better and better at identifying what toxic text is, which is good, because maybe we, that means we can use them to better combat um, the generation of harmful text. However, also, if we actually uh, put these models or a base language model in the setting where it's given prompts of increasingly more toxic text, it's going to naturally, as it gets larger, better emulate that style and generate more harmful text. So that's bad. So this is, yes, yeah, similarly, okay, the colors, apologies, I made this um, inverted. You can't really tell the colors, but there's different buckets of prompt toxicity and and generally, the trend is going slightly up. It's certainly not getting better with scale. So more powerful language models can create problems as you scale them up, even though there are actually very useful capabilities as you scale them up as well. For example, if we look at them in the classification domain. So this kind of the conclusion from this section is just scaling up models and hoping that they will sample the text that we want is not going to be a fruitful approach. And then the other conclusion from this section is, however, we are still learning useful information by scaling them up, so how can we harness it? And that's what I'm gonna talk about in the next section. So to recap on two notable issues with um, pre-training and then the sampling of models that we, we mentioned in part one, we model a large range of texts. Some of it does not, uh, is not kind of applicable to how you want to use the model. And part two, we actually don't train the model to sample specifically. We're gonna look at some techniques which kind of combat this. So. Um, for part one, we can think of uh, the original pre-training objective as, yeah, modeling the probability of everything. So it's kind of the probability of the internet, we could say, which could be some kind of large set. So this is kind of large blue set of all the things that you want to model the probability of. However, it may be the case that actually all of the useful stuff, all of the behavior that feels like an intelligent agent is actually in a really small subset. So from this analogy, really, the problem becomes how do we shift this probability distribution to just cover the set of behavior that we actually want. So I'm gonna go over a few techniques that do that. The first one, which I think is probably the one that everyone really knows, and it's the one that um, maybe everyone's tried, even themselves, which is prompting the model. We can shift the distribution of this probability distribution uh, that the model comes up with by just appending text to the context. Um, this is sometimes called in-context learning, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in-context learning it can essentially be a way of steering this probability distribution and narrowing it down by giving it some kind of instructions or behaviors that it, you want it to emulate. Um, so we see this all the time specifically for, uh, at the moment, like image generation from text, like people have these kind of crazy prompts with stable diffusion, et cetera. But I wanna even like look at further back, um, we were playing with this stuff um, in 2021 in kind of funny ways. So, um, we had trained this large language model called Gopher, and we kind of iterated on this kind of funny like pre-transcript prompt, which unfortunately you can't read, but um, I think the main thing to convey is we spent a lot of time like creating this pretty comprehensive historical conversation that we essentially insert into the context before the user has typed anything. And what we found by doing this was it transformed this language model Gopher, this 280 billion parameter transformer, from something that said weird things like when you asked it a question, it wouldn't answer, it would just give you lists of questions, to now something which behaved like a dialogue agent and actually really wowed people. So internally within DeepMind, this like really transformed like, oh, this model is capable of a lot more than we thought, and it just kind of came from like giving it this kind of weirdly crafted transcript, which not only kind of tried to unlock capabilities, but also steer away from like harmful uh, use cases. There's another instance of this prompting which I think I'd like to highlight, which is uh, a paper from Google Brain, which was um, so not necessarily putting text before the user's prompt, 
but four question answering tasks, putting a little bit of text after. Little kind of words of encouragement to approach a problem in a systematic way. So let's think step by step. So what they found in this paper was just by adding the text, let's think step by step, you could jump from something like a 17, 18% accuracy on a maths benchmark to 80%, which is quite shocking, really. Because if you're originally at 18%, you might think, well, let's specialize a lot in maths research. Let's collect more data. Let's uh, like really hone down on teaching this model how to do maths. And it turned out it kind of had a bunch of nascent capabilities that just needed to be revealed by steering its own probability distribution. It's kind of cool. Another technique, in some ways the most stable technique of machine learning is fine-tuned. So continue doing language model, continue doing language modeling as a fine-tuning step, but do this on a much more restricted set of data, which is kind of more high quality and is more reflective of how you want to use the model. So one example from this is from Google as well, was Flan, where they just kept on training the language model, but now on a set of NLP tasks. And what they found was, so if we have model size on the x-axis and performance on a range of uh, held out NLP tasks on the y-axis, is the model's zero-shot capability uh, is increasing slowly over time, sorry, is increasing with model scale. However, if you do this fine-tuning procedure, you start to get like a sharper takeoff. So the untuned model is just scaling up your regular language model, and then your instruction tuning is doing this small amount of extra compute to just train the model to focus on kind of instruction-like tasks. You can also, instead of um, having a set of like just purely human data from the side uh, and then fine tuning on it, you can also get data from humans interacting with your model. So um, Instruct GBT was a, a fantastic paper from OpenAI um, last year where specifically um, they actually looked at several approaches, but I'll highlight fine tuning. They have human contractors kind of interacting with the model and then writing kind of desired outputs. So um, hopefully these kind of are a bit more in distribution for what the model is going to say, but they're going to kind of steer it towards improved responses. And so what they found, this is one result, there's many results in this paper, but what they found was if you took a pre-trained language model, I think this is probably GPT-3, uh, and then you, you could prompt it, which is a technique I mentioned before. And if you look at the number of hallucinations from sampling, you, you're approximately almost half the number of hallucinations. But if you actually do this um, instruction tuning uh, procedure with, with human raters, then you can basically go down to 4x, almost 5x reduction in hallucinations. So this is still just supervised fine tuning, but um, it's now supervised fine tuning on desired responses. Now, so that's kind of one way of kind of shifting the distribution, but I haven't really talked about the second issue, which is that the models aren't trained to actually sample. And we really want language models as a way to generate text as a first kind of, um, like, as, as the most important feature that they have versus just emit probabilities. And so doing that is hard because when you generate text, you are now doing a discrete process. And to optimize that, you have to have a discrete optimization. So this is why reinforcement learning ends up being a crucial tool. And crucially, if you let the model generate text, you kind of have to decide what is it even optimizing? What it should it even be trying to maximize? So the current in vogue uh, technique is to maximize human preference. So in human preference, what will happen is you'll define some task. You'll have a language model. Uh, you can still prompt it. You can still give it other tricks. But it's going to have a go at answering. And it will actually have multiple goes. You'll have multiple samples. And then you'll have some human raters that are either experts in the area um, to give it signal and like choose which is the best. And then you can use that signal, which is quite, um, it can be kind of, it's kind of nice because choosing the best is an easier task than necessarily having a very strict rubric of exactly and like scoring something perfectly. Choosing the best is like quite a scalable way of getting human feedback and it's quite, uh, it's quite time efficient. But then you can actually have a model try and optimize towards human preference directly. So it's now going to be sampling and it's now going to be actually uh, trying to maximize the, the output that a human would prefer. And so, okay, uh, this is used also in Instruct GBT. But um, there was a nice paper from Anthropic with this helpful and harmless assistant um, where they try this. And um, they essentially, so it's in the top right, I've circled it. They have two data points of performance on 
um, in terms of comparisons, where they essentially find training re with reinforcement learning online, so learning to actually sample and learning to sample such that you're maximizing the preference of what humans want from this task, ends up kind of sitting around the ballpark performance of their expert uh, human annotators, which was very cool. And it was a lot better than the blue line is essentially kind of uh, a fancy way of prompting the model. So okay, we've thought about some ways of restricting and modifying the probability distribution to make it kind of fit the tasks which we think are useful. And we've also thought about how to train a model uh, to actually um, sample during training and actually trying to maximize something that's important to us. Are these the only, oh yeah, actually I shouldn't have, I forgot this slide. You may also, uh, this is actually probably most gonna sing out to you because ChatGPT also uses RLHF and uh, if any of this talk kind of felt a bit abstract, maybe you could summarize it by, there was a base model language model on the OpenAI for about a year, which people occasionally played around with, and then a bit of RLHF, and a, a UI for chat, created ChatGPT, and it suddenly sung out to people and really, I think, uh, excited people, and, and, and people currently are using ChatGPT at an unprecedented rate, so uh, this is the magic ingredient. However, are these the only ways we can kind of do downstream training? There's other ones which I won't go into detail on, which are different approaches, and I just want to highlight them to kind of give the impression that there's actually quite a lot happening in this space. So you don't have to optimize for human preference. You can optimize for kind of a set of rules, and maybe this could be quite good for very specific types of behavior you want to avoid, such as hallucinations. Maybe you can define a rule of what hallucination is quite clearly, and then just optimize away from it. And you can also, uh, so that, that's what's being used in a, a paper from DeepMind, DeepMind Sparrow, which is a dialogue agent. Also, a, a even more fancy approaches from Anthropic, it's called Constitutional AI, but the whole point is to first write down a set of principles of what the language model should try and adhere to, and then they have quite an elaborate process to bootstrap those principles out to data, which they then train on, and then also like via supervised learning, and then also via reinforcement learning. So, I would say these are kind of what are on the horizon. These are very new techniques. These are kind of what's coming next. Great, so uh, yeah, we talked about what are language models. They're getting very powerful and very impressive, but there's a, a clear um, element missing that we need to plug with powerful downstream training. We talked a bit about how making them more powerful can actually reveal better and better capabilities in the classification regime, but they kind of can still uh, bring consistent issues in the sampling regime. And then we covered the various ways people are looking at downstream training to kind of align and improve the utility of these models. Thanks. Thank